What suture do you want, Doc? All right, that is a question I'm asked every single day, whether I'm doing a bowel anastomosis, if I'm needing some ties to tie off vessels, if I'm closing fascia, if I'm closing the skin, if I need to put some stay sutures in, whatever I'm doing, I'm always asked what suture I need. So today I'm gonna teach you all about suture. I'm gonna tell you the strengths and weaknesses of all the different types, whether it's multifilament, monofilament, absorbable, permanent, whether it's biologic or if it's synthetic, we're gonna go through it all, all right? Let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I'm here to scale surgical education, get you more comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course to crush your exams. Today, a little bit less about the exams, a little bit more about the operating room. We're going to get comfortable with suture. Now, as a disclaimer, I am giving you examples of Ethicon Suture today. This isn't a paid video by Ethicon. I'm not sponsored by Ethicon, but it's the suture I use every day. It's awesome suture. It's suture that I'm comfortable with. So when I show you examples, that's what I'll be using, the Ethicon Suture. Okay, so we're going to get into it. I'm going to teach you all about suture. We're going to start out with the three main categories of suture. All right, hold on. Let's go. So there are three main categories when it comes to suture. First is the structure, okay? So is this a monofilament suture or is this a braided suture? Second is the composition. So is this a synthetic suture? So for example, Vicryl or Monocryl is a synthetic suture or is this a biologic suture? So fast absorbing gut, chromic cat gut, silk suture, these are biological. I'm going to tell you about the strengths and weaknesses of each of these. And finally, the degradation. So is this an absorbable suture? And I'm going to take you through the different sutures and I'm going to tell you how long each of them absorb. So how long does Monocryl last? How long does Vicryl last? All right. If you stick around, I'm going to teach you that. Okay. So absorbable suture versus permanent suture. When are those times when you want suture to hang around forever? Okay, maybe a vascular anastomosis, maybe a hernia repair. Okay, so those might be some times where you want a permanent suture, maybe a skin closure. I don't know. We'll go through it. Okay, so these are the three main categories. So, what is an example? Let's take a monofilament synthetic suture that's absorbable. Monocryl. I use it every day. I used it multiple times today. All right. So that's an example of a suture that fits these three categories. So I'm going to go through each of these categories and then I'm going to tell you what I think the strengths and weaknesses of each subsection are. Okay, so first is monofilament. So what are the strengths of monofilament? Well, first is it's smooth, so it glides through the tissue. It doesn't hang up, it doesn't cause a lot of tissue trauma, and that is really important. So for example, if I'm doing a neonatal small bowel anastomosis, I don't want a braided suture that's gonna cause a lot of tissue trauma when I bring it through, okay? I'm gonna tell you how you might be able to overcome that tissue trauma, all right? But in general, I don't wanna have a lot of tissue trauma in really delicate tissue, so monofilament is excellent for that. All right. So second is there are no nooks and crannies. There's no what we call capillarity or the ability to bring in bacteria into those nooks and crannies that you see in braided suture. So we don't have that in monofilament. What are the weaknesses of monofilament? The major weakness is that it can be difficult to handle. If you've ever tied you know, a, a 2O PDS, for example, or a 2O proline, it's a monofilament suture, it's a little bit bigger, it can be difficult to handle. You can kink the suture, and then that's gonna cause a weakness in the suture, okay? In addition, they stretch, and when it stretches, it can be almost like, you know, it can get all out of control, right? And it loses the architecture of the suture, okay? Um, and those are, so those are really kind of the weaknesses that I think when it comes to a monofilament suture. What are some examples of monofilament suture? So ethylon or nylon suture, monocryl, PDS, we used to joke, so PDS, perfect damn suture, okay, PDS, and uh, proline, of course, those are all monofilament sutures. 
So let's get into the multi-filament suture. With multi-filament suture, the strength is that it's really easy to handle. It's beautiful to tie with. So Ethabond is a multi-filament uh, braided suture, and it is beautiful to tie with, very easy to handle. It's also strong. And then you don't get any kinking in the suture. Like if you were to grasp it with a clamp, you're not gonna get a kink like you would if you had a monofilament suture like a PDS or a proline, okay? What are the weaknesses? The major weakness of multifilament suture is that the braids create these nooks and crannies so you can get increased bacteria in those nooks and crannies, capillarity pulling fluid or pulling bacteria into those little braided spots and that can be a source of infection. Now, there are some sutures like Vicro Plus, where you get this triclosan coating, and that is antibacterial. So there are some options when it comes to avoiding bacterial contamination, but it is something to be aware of. So let's take this example here. Like I said, Vicro Plus. So Vicro is a synthetic multifilament suture. It is 90% galactolide and 10% lactolide, okay? And then the plus, is that it's coated with this triclosan, which is a broad spectrum antibacterial. And so that'll decrease the bacterial burden and hopefully decrease uh, surgical site infections in that wound. So again, I did that video on surgical site infections. If you wanna check that out, get a really good understanding of that, all right? Well, let's go down and let's get into synthetic versus biologic suture. So when we get into our synthetic sutures, the strengths of these is that it's inert. Okay, it's not biologically reactive. So the absorption is by hydrolysis in the absorbable synthetic sutures, okay? And it has a very predictable absorption rate. So we can say that monocryl will absorb in this many days and bicryl will absorb in this many days. So it's very predictable compared to biologic, and we'll talk about this in a minute. When we think of the weaknesses, there aren't too many weaknesses to the synthetic suture. Perhaps they're a little bit more expensive, so the cost might be a little bit more, but very few weaknesses when it comes to synthetic suture. So if I was to come up with one, and I was to say, not cost, but something else, I'd say, well, with the monofilament suture, as I said before, you know, the PDS, the proline, sometimes they can be difficult to handle, okay? So that is one thing. But I think we're gonna talk about the biological suture, fast absorbing gut, chromic cat gut, that can be really hard to handle too. It's sticky and it breaks. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, what are some examples of synthetic suture? Well, it's the ones you see all the time. I use them all the time. So monocryl, vicryl, PDS, proline, ethabond. These are all synthetic sutures that we'll use on a daily basis, okay? So how about those biologic sutures? So when we look at biologic sutures and we wanna talk about the strengths, there are three major biologic sutures that we're gonna use. So there's silk, an example here. Now the strengths of silk, it's super cheap, really easy to tie, really easy to handle. For those of you who are practicing your knot tying, if you've checked out that knot tying video, you're probably tying with silk. It's a cheap suture and it's really easy to handle and tie, okay? Now, the weaknesses get into the other biologic types. So for example, chromic cat gut, or fast absorbing cat gut, this is really fragile suture. While I like to use fast absorbing gut on the face, tying 5-0 fast absorbing gut, it breaks really easily. So you have to be really gentle when you're using it. Same goes for chromic cat gut, okay? So something to be aware of with the biologics. The other weaknesses is that they're reactive. So the body reacts against them. If you do a suture of silk too close to the skin, you know, the integumentary system has a super powerful immune system and you're gonna get a suture granuloma or a little abscess that can develop around that suture because of its biological reactivity, okay? In chromic cat gut, you can have little uh, tattoos that are left behind uh, from the chromic if you're using that in the skin, okay? So something to be aware of, those are some of the weaknesses when it comes to biologic suture. Now, what are the biologic sutures? Like I said, silk, chromic cat gut, fast absorbing gut, and we'll talk about uses for these a little bit later on. So let's get into degradation. So absorbable versus permanent. So when we look at absorbable suture, well, what's the strength of that? Well, the obvious strength is it's gonna go away. There's, it's gonna be totally absorbed. There's gonna be no foreign body, okay? Well, what's the weakness? 
maybe the weakness is that it's going to go away. So you have to know if you're choosing the right suture with the right absorbability pattern that's going to fit your closure. So for example, PDS is going to take several weeks to break down. So that it's going to be okay for a fascial closure, all right? Monocryl is going to go away in a couple of weeks. So you probably don't want to use monocryl to close your fascia. So you need to know the absorption rate. I'd say, could that be a little bit of weakness? It certainly is if you don't know what you're using. Okay, so definitely know what you're using and why you need to use it for each of the different absorbable sutures. Now, when we talk about permanent suture, so the strength of permanent sutures, it's there forever. So if you need something to be there forever, for example, if you're doing a vascular anastomosis or perhaps you're sewing in a heart valve, um, or for in pediatric surgery, when I do a diaphragmatic hernia repair and I'm sewing in a patch or I'm sewing in a, uh, or I'm doing a primary repair of the diaphragm, I'll use an Ethibon suture. And that's gonna be permanent, that's gonna last forever. You know, if I'm doing a vascular anastomosis, like I said, that's gonna be a proline suture, 5060 proline suture, and that's gonna last forever, keep the vessel together, okay? I don't necessarily need to use that if I'm, closing fascia, closing skin, or doing a bowel anastomosis. And so the weaknesses are that it is going to be there forever. So a silk suture, you can get suture granulomas like we talked about. Uh, also the handling, like we said, of the monofilament permanent sutures, proline, the, especially the thicker ones, they can kink, um, they can leave big knots. So it can be a little bit difficult to handle with the uh, synthetic larger permanent sutures. All right, so one question that you gotta be asking yourself is how is suture sized, all right? So the suture has kind of this really funny way and we say, oh, I need a six O suture. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean six zeros? Well, yeah, it means six zeros, all right? So how did this all start? Well, when suture first developed, there was basically number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, okay? Now I have, the diameters of number one, number two, number three suture. But eventually they say, well, man, we need something that's smaller, smaller than one. So let's make zero. And they made zero. Well, then we said, well, gosh, dang, we need something smaller than zero. So instead of calling it negative one or something else, maybe an imaginary number, they uh, came up with, well, two zeros. And so the range of suture really is from 11-0 or 11 zeros, which is really narrow suture, okay? You can see the comparison to the diameter of a human hair here. So if a human hair is 0.18 millimeters, that's about a 3-0 suture, okay? Uh, and so the really small ones, those are used for like ophthalmic surgery, okay? And then the larger ones are gonna be used, for example, tendon repairs and orthopedic surgery, or we'll use larger suture for fascial closures or whatnot in general surgery. Okay, so this is how it's sized. 11 is gonna be your smallest, number three is gonna be your biggest. And when it comes to needles, those are really important too. We're gonna to do needles in a separate video and I'll tell you when you need to have a tapered or a cutting or a reversed cutting and what those different needles and the curvatures mean. So now I wanna move on to absorbable suture. And I wanna answer three questions, okay? What suture do you need? When do you need it? And why? All right, let's get on with it. So we're gonna go through each of these sutures. And the first one is PDS, all right? Perfect dam suture, polydeoxinone. Okay, and that's the chemical name for it. But if somebody asks you, okay? But if you say PDS, people are gonna know what you're looking for, all right? So this is an absorbable synthetic monofilament suture. Um, I'll talk about what I use it for here in just a minute, but I wanted you to see the absorption rates. So the absorption rate is different depending on whether you're using something smaller than a 3.0 suture. So 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, you know, that's a typical suture that I might use for bowel anastomosis. All right. Or if you're using something larger than a 3.0, that would be something that you would use maybe a, an O or a, a 2O for a closing fascia. And so if you're using that larger suture, like a 2O or a 1O, then you're gonna see that you have about 80% of that strength remaining after two weeks, where if you're using that smaller suture, you're gonna only have about 60% of that remaining strength. And you can see how this progresses as the weeks go on. 
So how long does it take to fully absorb? Well, PDS is fully absorbed in 26 to 34 weeks. Okay, so that's how long it takes this suture to go away. So I almost think of this as a semi-permanent suture. So if I have really important closures, like for example, a fascial closure, I'm gonna use PDS and it's gonna be around for the whole healing time. If we go back to the wound healing video, we'll look at wounds healing in six to eight weeks. So PDS is along for plenty of time for that wound to heal. Okay, and you can see here, here are some indications for using PDS or a PDS equivalent. So you can use a bowel anastomosis. You can use PDS to do a fascial closure. You can also use PDS to do a ligament or a tendon repair, okay? And it will be different sizes depending on what you're doing. So for example, in a child, I might use a 4-0 PDS suture for bowel anastomosis. In a neonate, I might be using a 6-0 PDS for bowel anastomosis. And for a child, I might use a 2 PDS to close fascia. A larger um, child or a late adolescent I might use a number one PDS. So the size is kind of dependent on the reason I'm using the suture and the size of the person I'm operating on. So let's move on to Vicryl. So Vicryl or polyglactin, okay? We saw that it's galactolide and lactolide, 90%, 10%. And you can see here, it's this woven braided suture. So it's a synthetic multi-filament absorbable suture, all right? And here I have the remaining strength over the first few weeks after you use it. Now Vicryl has a really predictable absorption. So at weeks two, three, and four, you're gonna have 75%, 50%, and 25% remaining strength. Now when is Vicryl fully absorbed? Well, we can see that Vicryl is fully absorbed in eight to 10 weeks. And what are some indications for Vicryl? So I use Vicryl for deep tissue closure, okay? Uh, if I'm closing, you know, Scarpa's layer, and I'm, I'm closing the deep dermal, I'll use Vicryl. Okay, um, you can also use it for bowel anastomosis. Now, I don't particularly like bowel anastomosis done with Vicryl. I think that there is some tissue trauma when you bring it through, but you can also get some wax, like bone wax. You can wax the Vicryl, and that makes it glide through the tissue a little bit easier. And another indication for using Vicryl would be for ties. So if you're tying off vessels, it doesn't have to be permanent for tying off vessels. A lot of times we'll tie off mesenteric vessels with Vicryl, and that works just fine. All right, now let's go on to monocryl. So monocryl is something I use a lot, especially for skin closure. So what is monocryl? Monocryl is polyglactolide with this additional part. So this additional part that makes it different than Vicryl is this Epsilon caprolactone. Okay, those are the building blocks for monocryl. You can also get monocryl plus, and that's where you have this antibacterial coating. Okay, and so you can see here, well, what is the remaining strength in monocryl. So monocryl has much less strength over time than Vicryl or PDS. So at one week, you're already down to 50 or 60%. At two weeks, you're down to 20 or 30% remaining strength. And at three weeks, you got no remaining strength left. So how long does it take monocryl to fully absorb? That's about 13 to 17 weeks, okay? And so what are the indications? When do we use monocryl? I'll use monocryl for deep tissue closure, I'll use monocryl for a running subcuticular skin closure, or even interrupted sutures in the skin and close that. But usually I'm using monocryl if I need to close the skin. So the last suture I wanna talk about is fast absorbing gut. Uh, similar to chromic cat gut, okay, but fast absorbing gut. This is a suture that I'll use for like a facial skin closure. Now this is a multi-filament, biological and absorptive. Okay, so it's very, very fast absorbing. And you can see here that the remaining strength drops off really fast. And in fact, this supports wound closure for only five to seven days, but it leaves virtually no trace. So for facial lacerations in a child, this is a great suture to use, especially if they're not too deep. If they are deeper, I'll close those deeper layers with like a, a vicryl or monocryl, and then close the skin layer with this 5-0 fast absorbing gut, okay? Now, it's fully gone in three weeks or so, but it really only supports wound closure for five to seven days. So now I thought it would be good. So what suture for what circumstance, okay? So let's go to skin. So in the skin, what do I use? So there's different options, right? So let's say that I'm closing a wound after a pilonidal excision or a caridacus flap for a complex pilonidal disease. 
All right. Well, in that case, I'm going to use a nylon suture, ethylon would be the Ethicon's version of nylon. Okay, so that's a permanent monofilament suture that is synthetic. Okay, now that's gonna last forever. So I can put interrupted sutures in, and if I want a wound that's a little bit more threatened, that might fall apart, I might leave those sutures in for a few weeks. Okay, now if I'm doing a skin closure, let's say that I excise the pilomatrixoma, which is a subcutaneous mass from a child's neck, Okay, well, I'm going to use like a 5-O monocryl suture, do a running subcuticular stitch. And then, of course, if I have a facial laceration and I want to put in multiple small sutures and I want that to oppose the wound and then go away after a few days, then I'll use that fast-absorbing gut. So that's something only going to support wound closure, like we said, five to seven days, going to be total gone in a few weeks. Now, how about bowel anastomosis? So I mentioned this a couple of times earlier. The sutures that I like for bowel anastomosis, my go-to suture is PDS. I like that it's a synthetic monofilament with very predictable absorption. It lasts quite a while and it glides through the tissue, so no tissue trauma. So I'll be using anywhere from a 4-0 PDS up to a 6-0 PDS, depending on the bowel, okay? But you can also use Vicro. So you can use 3-0, 4-0 Vicryl, 5-0 Vicryl if you want to. If you want to wax the Vicryl so it slides a little bit easier, you can do that. And it's safe to do that with a single layer bowel anastomosis. So most of the anastomoses that I do are single layer anastomosis. If I want to do a double layer anastomosis, I'll use that same suture for the mucosa to mucosal stitch, either a Vicryl or PDS. But I might put that back row and then an added front row or some Lembert sutures with a 4-0 silk or Neurilon suture, okay? So those are some sutures you can use for bowel anastomosis. Now, how about fascial closure? Okay, so fascial closure, you want a suture that's gonna stick around a really long time, okay? Not permanent because those knots in the fascial, fascial closure can be pretty uncomfortable, okay? So you can use a PDS suture. That's gonna be around for several weeks, like we talked about. Definitely at least through the six to eight weeks that you're gonna need it for that fascia to heal. All right, and so you can use anywhere from a number one on the large side to a 2 PDS to close a fascia of a child. All right, so PDS, a great suture to use for fascial closure. If you wanna get rid of a couple of knots, so usually when we close fascia, we'll have one stitch starting from the top and one stitch starting from the bottom or one stitch from the side, another stitch from the side. So we'll have two knots there and a knot in the middle. If you wanna get rid of two of those knots, and you have a bigger person, so you can use a nice big suture, you can use a number one looped PDS. And while that is a, a big suture and it, it does make a pretty good defect through the fascia when you're going through, comes on a big needle. If you do have a bigger person with nice, healthy, thick fascia, this can get rid of those two end knots so you just have that one knot in the middle. All right, so that's something to consider. And then of course, vascular surgery. So what do we use in vascular surgery? So we want a permanent suture. We wanna sew that vessel together. We want that to last forever, okay? Or if we're sewing in a valve, all right? And so an example would be a 5-0, 6-0 proline suture, and that's gonna make that anastomosis permanent. Finally, I wanted to throw in this extra kind of suture to get you thinking outside the box. So what are some recent developments in suture? Well, one is, this barb suture. So Stratifix, that's an Ethicon product, and this is really cool. So if you're doing a fascial closure, and there's some other indications for using this, I'll put a link in the description below. But basically, you don't need to try any, tie any knots. You do an initial loop through the beginning of your stitch, or the beginning of the closure, and then as you pull that suture through, it has a little barb, so once it comes in, it's not gonna back up, okay? And that's really nice because as you'll learn when you're going through your surgical training, if you're tying fascia and you're not keeping or the person follow you is not keeping adequate tension, you can get a loose closure. So you have to go back and pull up every loop to get that fascia nicely opposed. So this is just one kind of out of the box, one nice new advancement. And I'm figuring out how I can use this barb suture safely in pediatrics. So that was a talk on suture. I took you through the three big categories, we talked about the structure of it, so monofilament, multifilament. We talked about the composition, so synthetic or biologic. And then we talked about the degradation, so absorbable or permanent. I took you through the main absorbable sutures that I use and what their different 
degradation patterns were, what their absorption rates were. And then I gave you some of those examples of what to use when you're closing skin or balanosmosis or fascia or vascular anastomosis. So I hope you got a lot out of that today. I'll put some links to some information down there in the description, so check that out. And if you uh, like this video, definitely give it a like, share it with your friends, comment below. I love to engage with you. I love to know that I'm hitting the right notes, that I'm making videos that you guys find valuable. And when you leave a comment and you give me a pat on the back, you're like, hey man, that, back, that video was awesome. I love it and it drives me to make another one. Okay, so like always, stay safe, study hard. I'll see you next time.